Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Fethi Mansouri, and I'm the director of the Alpha Deakin Institute uh, for Citizenship and Globalization at Deakin University. Welcome, uh, all of you, colleagues, participants, and guests, to the ADI 2021 International Conference Recovery, Reconfiguration, and Repair Mobilizing the Social Sciences and Humanities for a Post Pandemic World. Firstly, I would like to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri, uh, uh, Wada, Waring, and Boon Waring peoples of the Kulin Nations and the Gondi Jamara people as the traditional owners of the lands on which Deakin University, Burwood, Geelong, Melbourne City, uh, and Warrnambool campuses stand. We pay our respects to elders past and present and acknowledge that sovereignty over these lands was never ceded. We further acknowledge the traditional owners of all the unceded indigenous lands from which participants are and will also be joining us for this virtual conference. It is no coincidence, indeed, that we kickstart this conference uh, a little later by critically framing, uh, uh, framing the notion of crisis itself in the context of indigenous experiences and approaches to prior crises, well before the onset of settler colonial society. Uh, the opening panel that my colleague uh, uh, Mark Rose will introduce and facilitate shortly will engage with indigenous accounts and approaches to recovery and repair from experiences of environmental, health, political, and other forms of disasters and crises. As a humanities and social sciences research institute, the Alpha Deakin Institute has always sought to uncover and account for various complex forms of inequalities and injustices. And pandemic crises are no exception. Through our expert analyses and commentaries, but also through collaborative partnerships and with community, governments, and industry partners. One of the core aims uh, of the ADI research has been and continues to be to produce the knowledge and evidence needed in order to actively shape public debates and advance policy agendas for the common good. Reflecting these guiding principles, we are proud to host this important and timely conference, the thematic focus of which reflects the breadth, nuance, and creativity uh, that drives our approach to social research. Fundamentally concerned with questions of power, inequality, and justice, our ADI research agenda, uh, our program, seeks to critically respond to these challenges from within its own geographical position in the global south, and more critically from its position on lands still shaped by the ongoing effects of colonialism. I am particularly pleased at the strong representation of indigenous and global south scholarships within the conference program. We do indeed have representations from uh, more than 20 countries with more than 200 people registered to take part in this conference one way or another. Before I uh, hand over to our Deputy Vice Chancellor Research, Professor Julie Owen, I would like to acknowledge uh, our ADI conference organizers, uh, led by uh, Tori Stead, who's here, and Maurizio Maloney, but also with the support of other colleagues, including Shahram Akbarzadi and Arif Saba and the Alfred Deakin Institute professional team who've done a fantastic job. Giles Campbell Wright, Carly Stafford, Yvonne Williams, and Silva Kreutzer. And of course, we can't really not mention the Deakin events team, uh, Georgina and, and Jody, and many members of the Deakin eSolutions team who are right now assisting us to keep things running very, very smoothly. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to invite our Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Julie Owen, to open the conference and to offer a few opening remarks. Over to you, Julie. University. First, I also wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which our campuses stand and all of those that we're gathered up here today as we meet virtually while physically dispersed. And I also pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. As Fethi's commented, and you all know, this conference will explore the contributions that the humanities and social sciences can play in the urgent tasks of recovery, reconfiguration, repair of our communities as we emerge from what is an ongoing COVID pandemic. But importantly in doing so, the context and impact of existing and enduring inequalities and vulnerabilities will also be considered. For Deakin, our new strategic vision as we embark upon the next 10 years is to harness the power of our ideas to help transform the way we live and think, to enhance the social, cultural, 
and economic and environmental well-being of our communities. And the focus of this conference aligns perfectly with, with that strategic intent and ambition. And our new strategy highlights five impact themes where we seek to focus our capabilities to create that positive progress and impact for our communities locally, but also importantly, globally. One of these, advancing society, culture and the economy, includes a specific focus on strengthening democratic and civil society through the application of critical ideas and the cultural and economic inclusion of disadvantaged and marginalised groups in society. So this conference and the Institute and all of its partners represented here today are really important vehicles to deliver on that ambition. The Alfred Deakin Institute is one of seven institutes and is really our world leading, in our view, Humanities and Social Sciences Research Institute. As Feth is commented, it seeks to create cutting uh, edge knowledge about citizenship, diversity, inclusion and globalisation, informing scholarship, public discourse and importantly policy to make a difference. Uh, it's recognised nationally and globally in these fields of endeavour, as shown by its talented and high performing researchers and scholars, but importantly the academic partners it continues to attract and who collectively are essential to make this impact possible. This program for the conference and the participants reflect this with many of our partner institutions here in Australia, uh, ANU, ACU, Adelaide, Central Queensland University, uh, Queensland, Griffith, UNSW, Sydney and so on. And here in Victoria, almost all our universities from La Trobe, Victoria, RMI2 through to Melbourne and Monash and so on are participating and are great partners in these endeavours. But what is fantastic is to see ADI's international partners, which includes institutions from all parts of the globe, EU, UK, North and South America, India and China, and of course, New Zealand. Let's not forget the little place over the earth and sea. Um, but look, all bring crucial perspectives and capability to help mobilise uh, the social sciences and humanities in the way that we absolutely need to create a better world in this case, our post-pandemic world. And to make the most of this in a positive way, this latest crisis, to hopefully address some longer standing challenges as well. So thank you for the opportunity to address you this morning and I wish you an enjoyable and productive conference over the next two days. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julie, and it is now my pleasure to uh, uh, hand over uh, and uh, want to introduce in a lot of details our um, colleagues here at Deakin, uh, Professor Mark Rose, he's, who's the um, Pro Vice Chancellor, uh, Indigenous Strategy and Innovation. So over to you, Mark. Betty and Julie, thank you for that uh, introduction and welcome and, and setting for this uh, gathering. Let's start proper way um, as an Aboriginal man um, who is uh, uh, a traditional owner from where one of our campus sits, Warrnambool. I'd like to uh, acknowledge um, the lands that we all come from and where we're either from or on today and also um, all our ancestries that we bring to this uh, gathering. Uh, if you look at the, the map of uh, Tyndale's map of uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Australia, you'll see it is a patchwork of uh, um, nations uh, uh, butted up against each other. Now, we've just had a president of the United States who saw borders are a place where you protect uh, in, and, in fact, put up walls. But traditionally in this country, our people have gone to the edge, gone to the borders to meet with respect. So borders between countries were meeting places where business like what we're doing today was done. And so can I suggest to you that it is going uh, away from the center to the edge of things, to the edge of thought. And that's where the creative tension is. And so, uh, in doing that, uh, can I ask us uh, in acknowledging country to, um, to recognize that we are partaking in an activity that is tens of thousands of years old of going to the edge to share knowledge with respect and learn from each other. Uh, I am a Gundijamara man. Um, my bloodline follows the Hopkins River 
and um, I bring the compliments of my elders and the respect of my ancestors to this gathering. I'm on today Wurundjeri land um, and um, uh, as uh, uh, Fetty and Julie were talking about uh, uh, Deacon, it's, um, how can I put it? it it's uh, a Wurundjeri elder, uh, William Barrick, um, who is uh, the great grandfather of Auntie Joy Murphy, who used to walk from Corrandoke in to meet Alfred Deacon and, and advocate for um, um, uh, better conditions for Aboriginal people, including health benefits, of course. And, um, you know, in, in saying that, um, uh, Deacon has been one of the uh, launching pads for Aboriginal reconstruction. Um, uh, I'm, it is believed that I uh, was the first Aboriginal student. I wandered into Deacon in 1979 doing a Bachelor of Social Science. Um, uh, this is a couple of years before Ike uh, happened, but there was a group of lighthouses across the country and as Bachelor uh, in Darwin, it is Task Force in South Australia, Tranby in New South Wales, Ike in Victoria, uh, that were the lighthouses uh, uh, that uh, the launching pads for our liberation. So um, I'd like to pay respect to where I am at the moment on the lands of the Wurundjeri, but also bring uh, the energy, the thinking, the, the culture of my people. And with that in mind, can I now pass to our two guests to uh, professionally and culturally introduce themselves? So Biami, you've come up on my screen first. So over to you, brother. Thank you, Mark. Um, really, really, um, really nice to be with you all, and I'm um, absolutely delighted to, be, to to have been asked to to uh, yeah give the give the opening presentation, the opening keynote of this of this conference. So, um, yeah, my name is Biami Williamson. Um, I am a Yuwali man. So my people come from northwest of New South Wales, but we also straddle the border up into Queensland. Of course, those borders aren't ours, um, and our country is kind of goes over that, 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 that land and bound by the rivers up there. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge my mother who comes from Cloncurry up in Northwest, New, uh, Northwest Queensland rather. And, um, and yeah, and I grew up down the road from Cloncurry and Mount Isa and acknowledge her family that go up into, into the Gulf of Carpentaria on the, on the Queensland side. So I'm a research associate at the Australian National University and um, yeah, sort of, just sort of landed this amazing gig of being able to, to, to speak to everyone at the start and have a conversation with you all. And I've prepared a bit of a presentation to kick us off. And um, so I'm just going to load yeah, I mean, can, can we hold that presentation and we'll Absolutely. get Karina to introduce herself culturally and professionally. Then we'll come back uh, to your presentation. How does that sound? Sounds great. Like a plan. Katarina, welcome. And over to you for your cultural and professional introduction. Kamna Māori and Nisambula Vinaka. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, it's an honor to be on this panel with you and with um, Bayami. Um, and I just want to thank um, Victoria and all the wonderful organizers of this gathering. Thank you for asking us to speak at this opening session. Um, I'm Katerina Tewa. Uh, some people know me as Kati. Um, I'm coming to you from the um, unceded lands of the Nunawal and the Nambri peoples in Canberra. Um, I would like to acknowledge their ancestors, their elders and their descendants. Canberra is very much a gathering place and one of those places that has brought many people together over thousands and thousands of years. Um, and we're very lucky to be in this country. Um, I'm an uh, associate professor of Pacific Studies at the Australian National University in the School of Culture, History and Language in the College of Asia and the Pacific. Um, and I've been here a long time and I'm also a graduate of the ANU. Um, I was the founder of um, undergraduate Pacific Studies at ANU and I have uh, a huge amount of passion for indigenous Pacific Island studies and that's what I've been building at ANU. Um, for oh, 14 years now. Um, it was the, can't do maths in a pandemic, that's for sure. 
Um, <laughs> but um, it's the first undergraduate Pacific Studies program in Australia. Um, so it's something that Tori and I have also been involved in through the work of the Australian, Australian Association for Pacific Studies for a few years now. But I'm originally from Fiji uh, by way of Rambi Island. And the people of Rambi Island, um, we are a minority, um, an indigenous minority in Fiji that originally come from Kiribati. So I'm descended from two islands in Kiribati, Tabitewea, which is in the southern part of the Gilbert Islands. Um, my grandmother and my grandfather are from the northern part of um, Tabitewea, or what we call Tab North, from the villages of Eita and Usiroa. Uh, Tabitewea is quite a fierce, known to be quite a fierce uh, uh, culture and community and staunchly uh, traditional um, in Kiribati. Um, so that's uh, one line. And the other is from Banaba uh, in the Western part of Kiribati. Um, this is also where my grandfather is from, where my, um, um, and his paternal line come from. And probably the place that I've been most engaged with um, because we ended up in Fiji because the Banabans were displaced from their home island uh, through forced migration to Fiji. So that's something I'll talk a bit more uh, about later, uh, but that's my Pacific ancestry. And then my mother is African-American um, from the US, from the East Coast. Uh, she's a descendant of slaves and of unknown white people that we don't know <laughs> that much about, um, but from Oklahoma, Virginia, Washington DC, New York, uh, South Carolina and other places. So that's me. And I'm on mute as if I've never used Zoom before. Katarina, thank you so much. Um, and um, thank you to the organisers for allowing for uh, uh, us to do th this keynote uh, in an in a Indigenous way. So um, we're going to now pass back to Biami, who is going to have uh, uh, a small presentation and we'll move into discussion after that, then to Katarina. And then we'll as blackfellas just yarn up for the rest of the, the time then ask questions later on so brother over to you thank you very much so i'm just going to share um and thank you kati for that um introduction as well um i failed to mention that i'm joining from the lands of the, the darawal people um south of sydney um and i'd just like to acknowledge their elders and their ancestors and their connection to country remains ongoing um, and, uh, yeah, something else I like to do is, uh, and you mentioned it at the start, Mark, and that is, um, you know, it's, it's really, um, we're used to doing welcomes or acknowledgements, obviously when we're meeting in person. Um, but when, now that we do zoom and we have kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of weird and wonderful space that we all exist in. Um, but make no mistake, this is where we are all now, even though we're all separated geographically, we are all sharing this space that we're in right now, where, where we can conceptualize it as a house, as a, as a room fitting underneath a, um, uh, you know, a, a tent of some sort or all in the tent at the moment. So this space that we're all occupying, um, I just like to um, claim that as Aboriginal land and just sort of welcome everyone to Aboriginal land that we're all gathering here today in this space that we all, um, yeah, that we're all, that we're all sharing at the moment. So yeah, I've, I've prepared a, um, just a little presentation, a short 10 minute presentation. And really it's, uh, it's trying to uh, make it fun, make it interesting, but also try and, um, um, try and keep the unsettling nature of a lot of the presentations that we give because I feel that you know the unsettle the unsettling is where you know growth happens and I think that's where we like to challenge people's thoughts and perceptions. Um, but because I can't wear you with a with an in person kind of keynote, I've tried to make it yeah a little bit unconventional as well. So we'll kind of um, I'm sure go uh, a couple of places that people weren't expecting. Um, yeah, so I'd like to start at a at a place and with a person whom no doubt at least half of you will um, will probably like and the other half will probably despise and that is with Tom Cruise. So this is an image of Tom Cruise in the 2005 film War of the Worlds directed by Steven Spielberg. 
I'm sure many of you have um, seen this film, are really familiar with this film, and would remember that the story follows Tom playing the lead character of Ray Ferrier, who, uh, with his two children, are forced to navigate the end of the world when giant looking squid alien things um, fall from the sky and start to obliterate the human race. So this is just one version or one retelling of the classic tale with a number of other movies and television uh, series now made. The story itself comes from a science fiction novel by English author H.G. Wells, um, which was first published in 1897. In this original book, H.G. Wells imagines what it would be like if an alien civilization uh, overtook and overthrew England using their advanced technologies. I bring to attention this novel and this story because firstly, although we may have viewed this and other post-apocalyptic movies and or read these books, um, comfortable in the knowledge that all this stuff is just made up, I feel that our engagements with these stories has perhaps over the last two years shifted. For the first time in most of our lives, COVID-19 has exposed the uncomfortable fragility of our society and the foundations that the society is built upon. There is another reason I bring this to your attention today as well, and that is that the original story penned by H.G. Wells was actually inspired by an historical event, the invasion of Tasmania by English colonists. In this way, the story of the War of the Worlds exposes an awkward historical and contemporary truth that there exist people in the world who know what the end of the world feels like. And in Australia, those people are us, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. For many people in Australia, COVID-19 was the second disaster to strike in succession. Of course, the 2019-20 was um, you know, is, is etched into, is uh, soldered onto the, the collective memory of all of us for because of the horrific bushfire season um, that, that we all went through. Um, it was the most incredible bushfire event, uh, incredible natural disaster in the history of the country. Um, and when I say sort of history, I refer to the work of Associate Professor Michael Sean Fletcher, an Indigenous paleoecologist, who through his study of ancient fire records using carbon dating and soil analysis has found quite frankly, no comparable fire event in the geological record of these lands. Understanding, quantifying and interpreting what happened in the 2019-20 bushfires from the perspective of Aboriginal people, communities and nations has constituted a large part of my work over the last two years or so. You see, what was immediately uh, apparent when the bushfires first started to take hold was that they were striking in regions with really large Aboriginal populations. This was later contextualised, the, the population demography was later contextualised um, uh, with the unique experiences of Aboriginal people in the fires, including the consequences of an inept response by government agencies and non-government organisations um, that made the disaster worse um, and produced a unique Indigenous experience within the bushfire crisis, something that remains an area of, of, of I guess, an ongoing inquiry. Um, but the 2019-20 fire season was the worst on record due in large part to an earth shattering drought that gripped Eastern Australia in the years previous. In the lead up to 2019-20 bushfires, 100% of New South Wales was declared drought affected. How else could the fires get so bad and so widespread? Scenes of dying livestock, mass fish kills, dry riverbeds, dust storms sweeping across the country were not uncommon. In fact, they were frequent. Considering these experiences, it is fair to say that the experience of people throughout much of, in particular, Eastern Australia um, over the last few years has been tra transformed due to a chain of disruptions. Uh, whether COVID-19, bushfires, droughts, um, and I haven't even mentioned floods or mice plagues, the human experience, um, the human experience recently has been one of constant disruption and disaster and crisis. Anthropogenic climate change, driven not by humanity, but by a singular social and cultural cohort, i.e. the West, is changing both our world and the human experience therein. 
Phrases such as one in 100 year event, record breaking, unprecedented have suddenly lost their currency. Sadly, this is the world we face and it is with every decimal increase in the earth's temperatures, increasingly the world of our children and our children's children. And so scenes such as this um, may not be that far from reality. Of course, this is just a promotional shot from the um, AMC uh, television series, The Walking Dead, where zombies take over the world and human survivors fight for survival against both zombies and each other. But whilst this may be the popular imagery associated with dystopian futures, these images are themselves socially and culturally constructed to create an image of a post-apocalyptic world that I guess we can engage with, um, you know, in a fun way that's kind of still separated from reality. But not all post-apocalyptic worlds look like this. For our ancestors, the ancestors of us Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people, um, I'm sure images such as this, um, which was of course taken at the height of the Black Silver bushfire down um, on the far south coast of New South Wales, this would have looked like the end of the world. Uh, images such as this, which is the dry riverbed at the Barwon River next to Walgan. Um, this is my home country. So this photo I took uh, standing on the riverbed in 2018 at the height of the crisis. This is what a post-apocalyptic future would have looked like. And for people at the original place of invasion, Sydney Cove, I'm sure that this would have looked like a scene from a science fiction novel or imagining. And this landscape transformed um, would, would be their post-apocalyptic future. And so I guess the message to take out of this is that for us modern day indigenous people, settler colonialism, um, our modern day reality, perhaps is the post-apocalyptic future of our ancestors. And although we embark on these journeys, never really have we had the opportunity to, as Professor Judy Atkinson has said, pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, and ask each other, what the bloody hell happened? So as the world moves on to COVID normal and we accept that our lives have changed irreversibly, the idea of gathering ourselves, picking ourselves up, dusting ourselves off and figuring out what the bloody hell happened is essential. And it is here that I firmly believe that the social sciences and humanities must lead as disciplines dedicated to and capable of interpreting and understanding the human experience at multiple levels and across multiple scales, it is optimally placed to lead in the recovery and regeneration of society. But as we may learn from indigenous peoples, this process of recovery, regeneration and reconfiguration will occur in the face of new and ongoing disasters. Namale. Thanks so much for that. Um, as I was taking in um, that, I, I didn't realize that War of the Worlds was uh, uh, based on the, the Tasmanian experience. and my nation being on the coast of what is called Victoria now, um, there's a deep relationship. Uh, the whalers would use women as sex slaves and pick them up in Tasmania and then drop them in what is now Portland Warrnambool. And um, there is a really close, there, there are families that are split by uh, Bath Strait, um, but the same family. So very powerful uh, message, particularly going back to the, you know, of 2020, 2019, that original disaster, um, uh, which we kind of forget because COVID came along. But uh, um, I know that an organisation that uh, a community organised, uh, the AECG or VAI, Victorian Aboriginal Education Association, we did a drive on goods to send them down to um, to Gurnai uh, country. Um, uh, where where the fires rage over that that new border, and I sort of uh, giggled that uh, the good people in the inner suburbs of Melbourne came and filled our organisation with toilet paper and and supplies, which we took down. Then COVID came along, and the same people were fighting in supermarket um, over toilet paper. So they're giving it away, then fighting over it. So um, those links that you made are, are really really close. Um, 
let's have a discussion uh, about that. Uh, and before we go to Katerina's um, uh, thing, Katerina, would you like to give some feedback to uh, the army? Okay, so so not doing my presentation. No, we funding? got it. Yeah, we'll we'll hold off and just have a, a discussion. It's um, you know, in 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 indigenous ways that um, our knowledge is very relational and um, we transfer. And one of the the methodologies is letting it wash over you. So to move straight into a transactional response is outside our domain. But uh, uh, but some initial feelings would be really good. Absolutely. And there were so many things I was thinking about. Um, thank you for your amazing presentation. Um, and I'm so glad you started with sci-fi as well. Um, uh, uh, Biami uh, used to study and work with my husband, Nick Mortimer. And Nick and I are huge science fiction fans. It's possibly the only genre uh, we, we watch regularly. And I've often wondered why I'm so obsessed with um, sci-fi, but it, it, it is because of the post-apocalypse nature of many um, science fiction films and the way in which it is awfully familiar if you are a Barnabin. So if you're Barnabin, you have come through a series of many, many different crises going back centuries and have constantly been figuring out how to survive in all of these different um, creative ways. So I loved um, how you set that up because sometimes people think that what happens to indigenous peoples is particular, as in it's, it's particular in the past, it's particular to history, it's particular to a set of political uh, or power or economic relations, but actually what happens to indigenous peoples, indigenous places and lands is usually a microcosm um, of what's happening much broader on a planetary scale. So if you look closely at a riverbed or you look closely at something that's happened to a people, you can actually on a um, moved on a multi-scalar level to thinking about what has happened to the planet as a whole. And that's where we are um, in terms of climate change and, this, and the sheer complexity of climate change, which everyone's trying to, to, to solve. And yet Pacific peoples, Aboriginal and Torres Strait peoples, Native Americans, so many peoples have experienced those things like on repeat over and over and over again, over hundreds of years. So it, it makes you wonder when, when do people in power actually learn from those experiences? When do they actually make different choices? And sci-fi is really interesting because the choice always seems to be technology. I'm fascinated with the fact that our prime minister and other leaders are like, well, in order to make sure there's still jobs and growth, we'll go to technology because technology is going to save the day. But what technology usually does in a sci-fi context is just take us to another planet so you can go colonize and destroy those ones too, or entire galaxies, entire universes. So I'm quite, um, I'm always confused as to why people don't hook up the relationship between industrialization, colonialism, empire, you know, lifestyles, consumption, extraction, you know, all of those things, why they don't link them all together and actually change their values. I, I don't understand why people think science and technology are going to save us when science and technology are part of what created the problems that we're in today. So I really appreciate you starting with that beautiful, you know, kind of planetary level imagination and then challenging that imagination through your work. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Katerina. And Biami, I also, you know, it, going back to that Tasmanian link to War of the Worlds, it's, uh, I will, I wonder how often we realise that that colonial experience uh, on, on a, a, you know, the invasion and capitulation of Aboriginal nations um, gave a model that was replicated in other places. Um, you know, the apartheid. Um, anyone who um, can name me a, a Victorian town that hasn't got a boundary road 
um, I, I'd be uh, interested to hear what that town is. But Boundary Roads were the demarcation line for Aboriginal people. Uh, they could not cross over. They had to stay on the fringe of, of, of the town. So anytime you see a Boundary Road, that's a colonial uh, construct that went to South Africa as part of their uh, apartheid uh, regime. And uh, uh, just talking about uh, uh, South Africa, um, uh, a countryman was in a cab uh, in Johannesburg and um, he saw the nameplate of the taxi driver and it was Kapunya. So Nun and Jerry, um, Kevin Kapunya, the Aboriginal comedian, same spelling and he said oh look we've got you know i got a relative who's got that surname taxi driver turned around and said yeah that would be right uh because the taxi driver's great great grandfather went and fought in the boer war and uh when it was time to come home when the war was over which is a teaser alert uh when the war was over um uh he wasn't allowed on the boat to come back to australia because he was black so um you know, uh, that model of, you know, in some ways there uh, were no hard and, you know, or not, not much creativity in colonisation. It's take away economic, uh, play around with health, uh, mess around with families, forced migration, um, were all the same things that were applied in other places. And taking it to War of the Worlds is a really interesting take, Bionni. So thank you for that. No problem. And um, I'm glad you brought up the international and sharing of experience across borders and whatnot, because um, during my time, I've been lucky enough to study, um, do a master's in Canada and do a graduate certificate in the United States, the University of Arizona. And when you go over and you learn about the history of colonization in a lot of these places, it's really, for me, it's remarkable. The same names that come up here in Australia come up in North America. And so you had this kind of this system, this kind of um, you know, the, the, this rotation of these early colonial thinkers of early, of, of early kind of settlers, of early governors, um, explorers, you know, connecting Indigenous peoples from North America and down here to through the Pacific and into Australia as well. It's all the same names. And so, but with all those same names, we get the very similar situations in the experience of Indigenous peoples because there were those situations and realities have been created by the same people with the same ideas. And so, which is why I see forums like this as really powerful because it's kind of like, a, it's, you know, re reverse engineering, right? It's kind of that they were talking and sharing ideas about how to colonize indigenous peoples and exploit lands. And we're talking about a decolonial process and sharing those ideas. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great trying to take the, take back the tools. And, and brother, if I could be critical of ourselves as indigenous people, we kind of followed in a, a semi-racist sort of bent by um, by moving close to the Kansas countries, um, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States with a shared colonial history, but under our noses, we've got uh, with, you know, Katerina in the, in, in the room at the moment, we've got all those Pacific indigenous nations and, and Timor, um, so I, I often am critical of ourselves by, you know, um, migrating. And, and it was probably natural, probably being too harsh on myself, which is not my usual thing. But um, we migrated to the Western colonised countries, whereas um, I, I would move, love to move to create better relationships with uh, Indigenous people right on our doorstep. Couldn't agree more. So um, with that in mind, we might move to you, Katerina, um, for your presentation, and um, then we'll have a, a, a follow-up discussion amongst ourselves after that. Then we'll uh, open up to questions. Does that sound like fun? Great. Okay, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, let me go with the screen sharing. Did that come through okay? Yes, okay, wonderful. Um, I did a quick uh, switch of my slides because of um, the wonderful way in which um, Biami opened up because I think this uh, 
particular um, Hawaiian proverb is a good, uh, a good uh, place to link things. Um, it's, um, it's a ohe pao ka ike i ka halao ho'okahi. All knowledge is not taught in the same school. One can learn from many sources. So whether it's stories, uh, sci-fi, science, social sciences, humanities, um, all our different indigenous knowledges. Um, I come from a, um, an intellectual uh, genealogy that's very much about um, indigenous, specific, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary and creative ways of knowing and being and doing, producing knowledge, um, uh, sharing knowledge, and it very much informs my teaching, my research, uh, even my admin, my outreach, and everything else I do uh, in the academy. So um, I'm quite passionate and committed about existing in the spaces between disciplines where you get to constantly weave different knowledges together. And indeed, that's how Bunnabins, uh, who ended up being a small community in between much larger communities in the Pacific, um, recreated, reconstructed, uh, and healed after a series of many uh, traumatic um, historical incidences. So, the, the theme today of crisis and repair uh, very much for me resonates with this idea that the repair comes from existing in the spaces between and that relational space, Mark, that you emphasized, um, but in that relation, relational space between peoples and between knowledges as well. So I just um, wanted to make that connection to the wonderful uh, presentation that Biami just gave and, and emphasize um, that in bringing the many sources together, we're focusing on the relational aspect of knowledge and people as well. Um, so I'm in um, Pacific studies and in Pacific studies, you never get just get to talk about one part of, of the Pacific, even though you might be from a particular island in the Pacific or be knowledgeable about one corner of the Pacific. Um, Pacific Island studies is also about understanding how things relate to each other, the complexities of our region and how it's a real region, as in it's connected genealogically through kinship over thousands of years, it's connected geographically, um, it's connected uh, through uh, the flows of the currents and, and, and our massive ocean, which is one third of the whole planet. Um, and I think one of the sayings uh, in, in the COP discussions or in the lead up to it um, has been, save the Pacific and you save the world. And you save the Pacific and you save the world because it's one third of the whole planet. Um, the Pacific is like functions uh, like this barometer, it functions like the lungs, of the planet, it regulates temperature, it absorbs carbon, it does so many things. So what happens to the people who live in this ocean, even though they're small populations, people who know how to survive in this space for thousands of years, clearly have some knowledge, some important knowledge about how to survive um, and make it through the many, many, many um, environmental, social, political, and economic crises and challenges that have faced um, islanders and, in, and indeed native peoples everywhere. So the, the, the um, yellow, rect uh, relo yellow triangles in, in my map um, are the places that I'm more specifically connected to. So Banaba in Kiribati, which is right there near the equator. Um, Rambi Island in Fiji, which is uh, in the Southern part of the Pacific. Hawaii, um, which is where um, most people in my family did um, um, either their undergraduate or their master's uh, studies and where my parents met and married uh, at the East West Center, which was this place in Hawaii that brought people together from across the oceans. And, you know, it was the meeting place for people of different cultures and, and backgrounds and different parts of the world. Um, and that's how my African-American mom met my um, Bonobin dad 
Barnabin and Tabitha Wendad, who was the first Barnabin to attend uh, university in the 1960s. Um, so I also have Australia and New Zealand on this map because Barnaba, which is where my, my father's, one group of my father's people are from, was mined for phosphate, mine and that phosphate uh, removed almost 90% of the surface of the island. And that was taken mainly to Victoria, turned into superphosphate and spread over the farms of Victoria, parts of New South Wales, South Australia, uh, and Western Australia as well. So our land, the land in which our ancestors had been buried for thousands of years was dug up and mined by Australia, New Zealand and Great Britain and spread over the farming fields. Um, and in a, in a way consumed <laughs> by um, settler colonial populations and everywhere else they exported, you know, the, the, the produce of farms to especially um, in Great Britain and Europe. So we have, Barnabans have an unusual kind of multi-sided indigeneity because the very ground to which they belong to was moved. So Banaba means the rock and people of Banaba are Kaintiapa, they belong to the land. So you are people of the rock. And what happens to the rock happens to you. So when phosphate was discovered in 1900, um, it set off a series of like traumatic global experiences that converged on this one six square kilometer island in what is now the Western part of Kiribati. And you'd never think six square kilometers could be so important to anyone, but it was, um, it yielded 22 million tons of phosphate rock, which was mined alongside Nauru, which people are a little bit more familiar with, the story of Nauru, which has now been turned into a refugee processing center for Australia at great uh, cost to everybody, including Nauruans. But Banaba was mined alongside that island and our land was taken and spread over Australia and New Zealand. So from an indigenous um, perspective, it sets up a very interesting, awkward, um, and yet potentially productive and creative kind of um, kinship with the people um, of, of that, you know, who belong to the lands um, of these two places. And it's something I've been thinking through and it's a slow thinking through in terms of what kinds of kinships and relationships are connected uh, or are created through this uh, imperial and colonial extraction of our lands. Now, Banaba, um, because of this particular history, it's been one of those shameful corners of Australian history that nobody wants to talk about, especially if you're in government and it's in the archives and just leave it there because nobody, you know, it's just a bad 80 year period of, of Australian imperialism um, in the Central Pacific. But it came up recently through this story in The Guardian. The Guardian has had a, a series called Pacific uh, Plunder. And um, Joshua McDonald wrote this story, The Island with No Water, because people on Banaba had run out of water. There had, there had been no rain uh, in three months. Um, and it was a really dire situa situation where diseases were, uh, were spreading, people were starving, people um, did not have access to, to fresh water of any kind. Um, so because of the mining, um, the freshwater supplies on Banaba had been destroyed. They're, they are underwater caves called Te Banga Banga. And they'd been there for centuries and um, Banabans had figured out how to uh, protect this freshwater source so that even though there were constantly droughts on Banaba, they always had that source of water. But because of the mining destroying the surface of the island and destroying all those different layers of the land through which um, water could be, you know, de decontaminated, they essentially contaminated and made toxic the surface of the island so that any water that collected in the freshwater caves below uh, was polluted and, and was not, people on the island couldn't drink it. So there are about 300 people 
who are caretakers of Barnaba who live there and the rest of the uh, Barnaban population, about 6,000 or so, live in Fiji and now in Australia, New Zealand and elsewhere. But these are our caretakers who live on Barnaba and they were suffering from the lack of fresh water. So there was an immediate global spotlight put on Barnaba. Um, but the solution was, uh, here are some parts for the desalination plant and then some bottles of water, <laughs> you know, like a Band-Aid on top of this gaping wound of, a, of an island that's been destroyed uh, to build essentially settler colonies. Um, so Barnaba comes back into the spotlight um, through that story. And this is kind of what um, that mining did to our lands. And because it's such a small place, they were digging out from under people's homes. It wasn't like, oh, that's a mining place over there and this is where the people live, which is what it was like on Nauru because everybody lives along the coast. Barnaba is much, much smaller. So in order to access rich superphosphate, you have to dig it out from where people are living. And this is what starts to cause um, the physical, the geographic, the social, the economic, um, displacement um, of Banaban people. So um, I could go on about that story, but I think what's quite relevant to our topic today is, um, you know, you have crisis and then you have hopefully repair and healing and reconstruction or trying to figure out ways to get through to get through um, crises. And the Pacific is one of those places where we've had so many crises going back, you know, to the 1500s when the Spanish first entered uh, the Pacific and discovered Guam. It's actually quite amazing to imagine that Pacific people are still here. Um, I, I went through some of the statistics on uh, in terms of what had happened uh, to pop Pacific populations um, after Europeans arrived, after Captain Cook discovered everyone. And the sheer scale of depopulation is extraordinary. It's amazing to think we're, we're all still here, but clearly we're still here after, you know, all the sexually transmitted diseases that people brought, the dysentery, the smallpox, the measles, the influenza, all of those things that cause sometimes, you know, at least a 50%, if not more, population collapsed. Um, Pacific people have been doing something to keep going, to keep their, their knowledge, uh, their, their populations, their traditions, their values, their customs. They've been doing something to keep it going. So I started studying Barnaba with this idea that it was all bad. It was all terrible, you know, pity, 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 so much suffering over time. And then started to actually discover that Bonobans had come up with all of these really interesting, creative um, strategies for reconstructing their culture, trying to find bits of their language that had been lost, um, using the creative arts as a way to, to heal themselves and um, come to some sense of agency and empowerment against global forces that were constantly descending upon their island that no one had heard about until they found the phosphate. So I did some creative film work. Um, when I would go out to do my research, I would document everything um, on my video camera. And as a student at the ANU years ago, you were told you had to write 100,000 words out of that. But I kept seeing people dance and sing and make things and do all kinds of wonderful creative work. So I started imagining how I could turn this into creative things 20 years ago. And it's taken me about 20 years to actually get there and start doing creative work in a really um, confident way. So um, I've turned my research in the archives and in um, um, my ethnographic work into multimedia um, stories about what happened and turn them into stories that are accessible to, to the public. They're beyond the academy. Um, I know we're expected to do journal articles and book chapters and books and all of those things in the academy, but for me, the story of what happened to the Bonobans is something that's a global story, even though there's only about 6,000 of us 
um, in the world, but the kinds of things we've experienced and the kinds of strategies we've come up with to survive creatively, I think are important and interesting um, stories and strategies to share with others. And, and others who are in other parts of the world who are experiencing similar things to us. So there are indigenous people in um, the Western Sahara who are also suffering from the extraction of phosphate from their land. So it's not just unique to the Pacific, but what's happening in Morocco, like um, Mark and Biami, you were talking about before, there are overlaps because it's the same actors at the same time creating these same structures of extraction that impact indigenous peoples in particularly damaging ways. So there's still people in the Western Sahara protesting over the um, phosphate mining that's been going on there. And Banabans, you know, in the uh, completely different part of the world, really understand what they're experiencing. So I turned all of this into a multimedia exhibition uh, called Project Barnaba, which started in 2017. And this for me is my form of healing and repair and trying to still be a custodian of lands that have gone, like they're not there. So you have to just imagine 22 million tons of rocks where they've ended up and they have ended up polluting quite a lot of fresh waterways in Australia and, and New Zealand and elsewhere. But I've been following and tracking the flows of our land and still trying to be connected to it. And I do it through this creative practice. So this is the kind of work that I do now in tandem with um, my normal academic and admin and, and teaching, because I'm trying to get this story out there to wider audiences and, and think about how you bring the past and the present together in one space in ways that are evocative and, and meaningful and hopefully inspire us to make some different decisions uh, about the future. So I think I'll leave it there. Okay, um, thank you so much for that and, and such a moving and, and um, uh, presentation. Um, I loved your comment about surviving creatively and um, people wax lyrical about Aboriginal people and their resilience and, um, and yeah, I know, I know that to be the case, but how we can express knowledge through other ways and journal writing and, and you were able to, you know, immerse all of us in, in a, a situation I knew very little about but uh, the markers in it, the trace markers, are very relevant to the experience I've had in my life and, and what my uh, relatives have seen. Uh, surviving creatively, um, one of the big survival things for uh, our mob, uh, Biami, I'm sure you all agree with this, is our sense of humour. And it was brought home to me when I co-chaired the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in custody here in Victoria. Now, our um, 18 months that still keeps me awake at night, but sort of still pushes me to drive to, you know, work hard for our um, liberation. And I remember uh, in the centre of Melbourne, it's the, I was able to go to every prison, which um, uh, in, in the state. Um, and but the Melbourne assessment prison, the map prison in the centre of, of Melbourne, um, I had to go there and meet with the Aboriginal um, the group there. And I had an escort with me and I'm walking through general population. And it's like being a former teacher. It's like uh, being on playground duty or with the worst school out, you know, there, you know, so I'm walking with, with and my escort says, I don't know where the Aborigines are. And I said, stop and just listen for laughter. And we pointed it and we went there. And that's where the, uh, the Aboriginal group were. And they're there building up each other, laughing and, you, you know, to, you know, and surviving creatively. So um, uh, it, it's something that is inherent in our uh, DNA. Biami, have you got um, some reflections on Katarina's presentation? Yeah, I've got a lot. Sure, you have. Sure, yeah. you have. Uh, I, you know, I've been busy kind of 
writing down a, a number of pages from your book, uh, from your from your presentation. So thanks, Cassie. It's just amazing. But uh, but I'd say like there are so many striking similarities between um, your presentation and sort of things that came up in mind, but also the more generally the experience of Indigenous peoples on the Australian mainland. Um, you know things like yeah just the devastation of lands through extraction um you know um i think it's an unfortunate reality that we all share um water security i mean you know uh, would not be surprised if the next world war is fought over water clean drinking water because it's such a scarce increasingly scarce resource um and um yeah it's and, and when you what um when you were talking, I was just kind of amazed at, uh, and it, and it really does astound me the history of Polynesians and um, and and you know all, all the other kind of Pacific Islander groups as well. Um, you know the 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 incredible history of you know, quite frankly conquering the greatest ocean in the world many thousands of years before you know um, people could who could sail across the Atlantic or, or or were capable of sailing anywhere else when people still thought the world was flat. So. You know, um, I just think it's such an incredible history and one of the hallmarks of colonisation is dispossessing us of our own history. So it's so important to tell and retell those stories and make sure you know, our own ingenuity really comes to the fore and that's, you know, front and centre of, of what we're teaching our, our kids. Um, and when you were talking and sort of talking about the early colonists coming through and, on you know, on the boats and kind of moving around and... When I was in Canada, one of uh, an incredible story that I heard from one of my classmates, um, uh, who, who's New Char North from the Vancouver Island, from the west coast of Vancouver Island in, in, in Canada. Um, they, they've still got the story of um, when Vancouver um, came in with, on the ship with the sails. And then, um, so really, it was the first interaction they'd ever had with um, Europeans. And um, they called them people, like they, they called them a name. Um, because they obviously didn't have a name for them, but the, the name was translated to like people without a land because they came on ships and then they left. And I'm like, what an amazing way to think about, you know, um, to think about this new, these new kind of people that have kind of come, the people without the land. And then I've always remembered that. And then I've thought about it years and years later um, because it is so true. It's people without a land, it's people married to an ideology and not to a land base. And that's kind of a really dangerous situation to be in and a really dangerous way of life. And I think we see the consequences of that now, but I'd also like to say that that's not like, be careful, need to be careful not to kind of lump all kind of non-Indigenous people into this, into the, into this ideological, um, onto the ideological arc. Um, because the fact is, when you you know study Western history as well, like all of the ideas of these extraction and colonization, they've been contested by thinkers within the Western um, within the you know Western Academy as well, and with Western society and the Western legal fraternity. So it's um it's just to kind of say that although these ideas have taken hold and they have dominated for many hundreds of years now, they are not without contestation from within their own kind of social and cultural group, and they're certainly now being contested by from um from all of us you know from the global south from indigenous peoples and pacific people um and that's kind of our responsibility to to keep pushing back and to keep kind of um working with allies and and trying to to contain the damage that's already been done um and yeah just finally i just loved love love your um um you know using the creative arts as a way to process our experiences and a way to tell our stories is such an Indigenous way of, of, of engaging, of talking back and of bringing our people with us. So it's just wonderful to see. And um, yeah, hopefully you continue to do that work, Kati. Thank you. Absolutely. Well said, Biami. Um, so heading back, um, circling back to the theme that this is not our first pandemic, we noticed that uh, uh, in the media, uh, the pandemic has been split in, into variants. Uh, and I'm not talking about Delta and other variants, but uh, there's a social pandemic uh, and economic pandemic, you know, uh, uh, a disease, a medical pandemic. So I, I would cont contest that um, colonialism was a pandemic and, and, and that um, we are still very much uh suffering from it I, in my career i've seen uh what has raised I, I was 12 years of 
age at the uh, referendum. Um, I was locked away in a in a home. Um, uh, my education was limited to year eight at that stage, but because I was in a home, I actually went through to year twelve. Um, and I've seen the Black Academy rise in in this 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 country. You know, uh, in my early academic year, which was not in Aboriginal education, it was in business, which was very strange for someone who was a socialist in the seventies to end up working in a business faculty and peddling MBA. So if you want to put schizophrenic down in, in the in the in the remarks, you're both welcome. But um, having said that, it was 14 years before I had a black fella in, in front of me in, in the academy. And now uh, we we see that we've uh, you know the the rise of the black academy uh, here in this country uh, has happened. We've got Aboriginal people who are in senior Aboriginal roles, like the, the recent uh, PVC Indigenous at Melbourne has gone off to become a Deputy Vice Chancellor Education at a Queensland University. And I'd like to recognise Yin Paradis, who's uh, uh, been admitted into the Academy of Social Sciences just very recently, very proud. So we're working in general programs. I don't use the word mainstream because that's a, a value-laden term, but general programs, Aboriginal stuff. Uh, 18 years ago, uh, on my community uh, commitment, I instructed the CEO of Victorian Aboriginal Education to write to every kid who finished year 12 uh, in the state. And this was 18 years ago. And he said, yeah, I'll do that before lunch. There were two kids that finished. But last year, 700. So we're moving from the fringe into the real business. And um, Katerina and Biami, you two are, are really living examples of the rise of the... What panacea are, are we to that uh, pandemic of uh, colonialism? It's a, it's, a, it's a good discussion. I'll, I'll, I'll start if that's all right, Cathy, and then you can, um, yeah, you can um, um, uh, come in and, uh, and, and fix everything that I say when I, when I trip over, <laughs> okay. over my concepts. But, um, but um, look, I, I think it's, a, um, it's such a, it's such a, um, a critical part of it because the fact is, uh, obviously, as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia, we weren't allowed to participate in the education institutions in this country and, you know, yeah. in, 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 uh, until like 40, 50 years ago. Um, we are so far behind um, and we have not been able to occupy these spaces for so long. It's been denied us. And so I think we've got a lot of catching up to do and we're doing it rapidly. Um, and people like yourself, Mark, um, you know, acknowledging you and the efforts that you've put in over a really long career as well in creating, um, you know, not just kind of opening doors, but smashing them down. So, you know, and then, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of space and freedom that, 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 that we're very fortunate to have um, that were denied um, your generation. And, um, you know, we just hope that we live up to, to, yeah. to, to the promise that you've, that, that you've given us. But, um, but yeah, look, I, um, you know, to, to me, education, you know, um, being able to perform, being able to participate in Western education systems is essential. Um, but, we, but like there, there's a, we need to exercise a healthy degree of kind of caution and, and um, um, I guess, risk aversion to it as well, because it's, and I, I use the example of, um, of um, you know, some of the big scholarships in this country that support Aboriginal students, postgraduate students to go internationally and study. So I was really lucky that I got to go to the University of Victoria in British Columbia. And I, I chose that institution and that course because, um, because it was a course designed by Indigenous academics. It was taught by Indigenous professors and it had a majority Indigenous student cohort. And they were really, really important factors for me to go over and connect um, with, with kind of fellow Indigenous and Native scholars uh, elsewhere and, 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 and through my education here in Australia, something that I realized that I was always denied was having an Aboriginal teacher, um, having an Indigenous teacher through primary, through secondary, through tertiary, I'd never ever been taught by an Indigenous person. And so that's something that I really wanted to rectify and I had to go internationally to get that. Um, 
But in applying for scholarships here in Australia, um, I found it really difficult to find a scholarship that would support me in that choice. All of the scholarships here really try to push us into Oxford, into Cambridge, into Harvard, into NYU. And through that process, I, I was really exposed to, you know, quite, quite frankly, this, um, you know, how I've come to think about it is kind of a recolonization of Indigenous peoples through the educational institutions that we're supported to go through. Um, and that's like that, that's such a massive issue. We need to be supported to pursue our education, pursue an Indigenous education, to connect with Indigenous people all around the world, because these are the people who support us, who get us, and who we fight with and stand with on the international stage. Um, and, you know, but, but, but there's still a very big gap in supporting Indigenous students, especially from Australia, um, to, to, to pursue education in our own way. And I think that is kind of one of the next really big frontiers that we need to start tackling. I know that people have been doing it for a long time. So much work needs to be done in that space. Well put, brother. Katie, would you you'd like to respond to that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad you you mentioned all of that, Biami, um, because it it suddenly brought back this rush of um, memory for me. And I have a pretty bad memory <laughs> these days. I don't often remember what happened earlier in the week, let alone what happened in my childhood and teenage years. But one of the things I definitely remember is going to Santa Clara University in California, which is one of the oldest, um, if not the oldest uh, university in California. It's Catholic, so it's set up by the original Spanish mission in California. Um, it's a very um, elite, small Catholic university. And I, I, I got a scholarship, almost a full scholarship to go to Santa Clara University, but I remember feeling like I was in the twilight zone <laughs> because uh, um, not only through culture shock, because I'd just come from, from Fiji and all my study, primary and secondary school uh, in Fiji, uh, and not just because of the economic wealth of all of those around me who were like 18 and driving BMWs and going to Tahoe and Cabo and all of these places for their, um, their spring break. It was because in almost all of my courses, I, I could not recognize myself. I couldn't see the Pacific. And I, I, just, I just didn't know where I was. I felt really disoriented in most of my, um, my classes at, at the university except for the religious <laughs> classes oh. now. And that's because of the really great job that missionaries <laughs> did in the Pacific, you know? So the, one of the things that, that came along with um, the pandemics that wiped out, you know, much, much of the populations in the Pacific and also killed a lot of their leaders, which took a lot of the knowledge with them. So wherever the pandemics were waging across the Pacific, when, when your elders and your leaders died, that was this massive break where people had to reconstruct and put everything back together. And so Christianity filled in some of those spaces and conversion happened through this, this combination of, of the crisis and the depopulation and people questioning everything. So my family is Catholic. The women in my family are Catholic on both sides. And this is how I end up in a Catholic university in California. And at the very least, the Catholic our classes, our religion classes asked all of these questions in a way that made sense to me because they took for granted things that could not be seen, things that were sources from outside the visible world, etc. So and I ended up doing a science degree because every social science and humanities class kind of totally freaked me out. And I was like, what is it? How do you do it? Sociology especially was really difficult for me to get my head around. I ended up doing a combined wow. sciences degree, which was like kind of like this hodgepodge of chemistry, physics, biology, environmental studies, psychology, and then some social sciences and humanities around the edge. But I, I remember the distinct feel, feeling of being lost, being in California on the edge of the Pacific, where nobody understood the Pacific 
as far as I, you know, my version of the Pacific was like, it's a massive coast. That's all on the Pacific, but this is a different Pacific. So then from there, I had two choices, law school, where I thought, oh, I could do all kinds of things in, in law school and maybe figure out how to sue a government or a three governments, at the very least again, over what happened to the Banabans. Or I could go and do um, a master's in Pacific Island studies at the University of Hawaii. And my late elder sister, Teresia Tewa, encouraged me to go for the master's in Pacific Island studies, where I got to do Pacific studies. And that was a complete, just like, you know, blew my mind. And I went from being a pretty average student, you know, with like a B average at Santa Clara University to like A++++ because I was now in classes where we talked about the Pacific. We talked about Micronesia, Melanesia, Polynesia, and we took Hawaiian studies. And my, my supervisor was the amazing Hawaiian feminist, Haunani K. Trask, who is, was a force of nature. Like, you know, she was just absolutely incredible. So suddenly I had indigenous Pacific teachers uh, it, and and it just cracked open this whole new world. And I never turned back from that. I was like, oh, heck to the no. You know, once you, once you have knowledge and access to our own histories, our own experiences, going back in deep time, that sense of grounding and empowerment was just absolute goal. So I also agree with you about the importance of the academy for creating these spaces, because Hawaiian studies carved that out at the University of Hawaii, Pacific Island studies carved it out. They are in, um, in conversation and kinship and, and all kinds of other kinds of relationships with each other. But I get that, I get, you know, the Pacific, we I have unity in diversity and between all of that, lots of complexity as well. But that grounding in interdisciplinary Indigenous Pacific studies was everything for me. Like it was the absolute goal. So I agree with you. You know, we get scholarships, especially from the Australian government and Australian universities to capacity build and develop the skills of all the underdeveloped peoples. And I can tell you the development discourse in the Pacific, it's like colonialism. It's like you are underdeveloped and we shall build your capacity. Come and do this degree in economics. Come and do this degree in accounting. Come and do this degree in the other thing that will help bring you all into hypermodernity, which is causing climate change, right? It's like, what is this? So I totally agree with you about how it's so much more important for us to go and learn about things that re resonate and are from our own similar sets of values, experiences, and connections to place and to land and the oceans. That's all of it. It's, it's that grounding. It's that connection to place in the land. Okay, thank, thank you so much for that. And, and you can hear um, the passion in your voice. Uh, and, and we are all stronger as Indigenous people being visible and and heard in the in the curriculum, um, I know Kat, you're on Nunnawal land, and there's a great elder there, Auntie Agnes, who um, when she does a welcome to country, she um, I've seen senior public servants have to step out of their Jimmy Choo shoes because she says, "Let's do a welcome to country. Take your shoes off and feel Mother Earth." And when we've got a curriculum whether compulsory years where I've been doing a lot of work or uh, in, in the tertiary years that connects uh, everyone to Mother Earth, whether you're Indigenous or not, we will be moving to a far better place. I'm watching the time. We've got about five to eight minutes of questions. So, um, Tori, how will we handle these questions? Will they go through you or people put up their hands? Yeah, so Mark, people can use the raise hand function and then they okay, can, great. if you call on them, they can um, ask their question. People can also pop questions in the chat, but you just need to keep an eye on that, Mark. And sure, that. yeah. Two things at once, Tori, that's a bit challenging, but yeah, okay, let's go. If you, My preference would be if you raise your hand, that would be good, your virtual hand.
just while we're waiting for the first question, Yami, you, you, you spoke about me being the generation ahead of you. Can I share with you one of early days, as I said, no black fellas in the early days. Uh, in, so I, I taught MBAs um, and I remember I had classes uh, in, at RMIT in the city um, and I went on an Aboriginal march and we all were protesting and we decided to sit down on the corner of Swanston and Burke Street, stop traffic, but um, that was slightly before the mall there. And um, sitting there and we're, we're chanting away and one of my MBA students walked past and made his way through the crowd and asked me for an extension. So the chant went from what do we want, land rights, to what do we want, a two-week extension, when do we want it now? So um, that were the, the kind of fun days of that. So we might have some questions in the chat. Um, uh, no, we haven't. So what we might do now, um, one of the uh, working through a relational way of sharing knowledge is being able to read body language and I'm watching the people's body language on the screen and it's almost time for a coffee. So, um, Kat, would, I'd like to pass to you for some final wrap-up words. Okay, so I'm going to try to sc uh, screen share again because I did have a couple of... Um, I had a slide at the end that I thought might be a good place to at least wrap up my part. Um, is that okay? Does that come through okay? Yep, there now. Yeah, yeah. so, um, you know, given everything that's going on at the moment, um, you know, the, the intense discussions um, at COP26 in Glasgow, um, uh, the ongoing, you know, discussions about China in the Pacific, all the geopolitical wrangling. Um, the Pacific has become this space of intense focus and interest and attention um, in recent years, probably mainly because of climate change, but for so many other reasons, because it's one third of the planet, it is absolutely massive. So it's critical and it's the space between the US and Asia and, and that comes with all kinds of massive militarized strategic and geopolitical um, baggage. But during the pandemic, one of the first things that the Pacific did was shut, you know, from Kiribati and others shut their borders really fast, really quickly, because they were like, yep, we don't need to be connected and we don't rely on supply chains in the same way that everybody else does. And, and I'm so fascinated because I went back through and I was looking at the number of cases and the number of deaths. Uh, tragic deaths from COVID, which are really, you know, they're not great in Fiji, in French Polynesia, in Guam, in Papua New Guinea, and there are many challenges there. But it's important from my perspective for the Pacific not to always be in that narrative um, and framework of, of, um, uh, of crisis, of victimhood, and lacking agency, efficacy, well-being, and dignity. Because there is, because of the sheer scale of crises that have happened over hundreds of years, and particularly through colonialism and imperialism in the Pacific, Pacific people have developed all kinds of amazing approaches and strategies and beautiful um, and quite generous <laughs> knowledge systems, uh, particularly in the area of the arts, and have so much to share with the world. And you can see them leading on the global stage, you know, the Marshall Islands, for example, in the space of, of the COP um, negotiations. But I like to focus on the inspiring Pacific. And this is not a toxic form of hope or anything like that. It's about going back to that source, you know, that, that you mentioned the grounding and the connection uh, to place, which is so important. So these three, covers are of the Contemporary Pacific Journal. I'm the art editor of the Contemporary Pacific Journal and I choose to highlight the work of amazing Pacific artists, including in this case, three women uh, from, from um, Polynesia, 
uh, and Melanesia, Joy Enomoto, Lisa Hilly, and Latai Talmoe Peao, who are part of this upsurge of amazing Pacific activist scholars and artists who are reframing the narrative and telling different stories of empowerment from our part of the world. Thank you. Beautifully put. Thank you for that. And um, uh, that's the richness of the business that we're in, that there are different worldviews. And, you know, what if it's a gift that we leave our students is the ability to, to engage with different worldviews and to anchor themselves in it. So beautifully put. The army over to you, brother. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, and thank you, Katia. This has been an amazing, um, an amazing panel, and really, really privileged to be part of it. And look, look, just to sort of bring it back to the conference theme, you know, uh, well, yeah, the, or the title of this session. This isn't our first pandemic. I think there is just such a richness and a depth in the knowledges and experience of Indigenous peoples, and you know, but both even here in the Australian mainland, like a. a, a a depth of um, knowledge with regards to changing climate and what that means for human ecological responses um, and how how different societies and communities of people can adapt to be enriched through a process of, of, of adaptation, I think is really important. But it's also um, equally important to recognise the, I guess, the ongoing resilience of Indigenous communities in the face of colonisation. So when you have put them two together, the ongoing resilience in the face of colonisation and the, and the, and the I guess in the deep histories of living in, in, in the country that through climate change, I think it creates a really, um, you know, creates a highly valuable kind of knowledge base and perspectives to be engaged with. Um, and it would be great to engage and encourage um, engagements with those perspectives from, from the academy, from policymakers and governments and from civil society as well. But those engagements need to be coupled with supporting the self-determination of communities, of empowering, genuinely empowering Aboriginal communities and really breaking down the barriers of marginalisation and oppression that continue to, to be hallmarks of our relationships with the settler, settler colonial state. I know that in Victoria, you know, these discussions are going pr probably the most alive that they've ever been or certainly have been in the last 50 years um, through treaty and the truth telling the Europe Justice Commission and really encourage everyone to follow those processes and um, really try to set a high benchmark because these are processes that eventually when Australia, when the rest of Australia is ready, they will embark on. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, and, and just sort of reminding people of the fact that um, you know, we pre-colonisation, Australia was just a country just so rich in culture, so rich in societies and rich in ways of life. And there were people who lived, who loved, who you know, had families and there was so much joy and dance and music and art and everything. And all of those ways of life were fundamentally smashed through colonisation, beginning with the smallpox um, pandemic that, quite frankly, our population's still have never recovered from mm. um so you know it's taken us more than 250 years to even get back to close to populations that we're estimated to have had before um and it's got to take us even longer to sort of get back to a way of life where we feel genuinely empowered in our own lands so um yeah it's a it's a long road ahead um get used to being uncomfortable we know what it feels like um and I think it's something that wider Australia could, um, yeah, could, could, could certainly benefit from. And going back to, you know, what something that was said earlier, it's this is, you know, adaptation and, and, and reconfiguration. It's a technical process. It's a political process. But more than anything, it is a social and cultural process. And uh, we need to re-examine the values and the constructs of our society and what we, what we value as Australians and um, value each other and value this land. So yeah, thanks. Yeah, I mean, thank you for that. And in doing that vision, the future, uh, as is our way as Indigenous people, uh, a gathering like this would be finished with uh, song and dancing, but I'm not going to put pressure on Caddy and Barmy to sing it uh, or, or dance. So we, we've done it another way. We're going to subscribe to the gospel um, of, um, of Cold Chisel and we're moving to a song now, which uh, we'll be playing in a, a couple of moments. It's when the war is over. And can we vision when this war is over? Uh, let's not return to things the way they were. Let's, let's 
let's envision what a future can be. We turned around a potential economic disaster by job keeper, job seeker, um, etc. So why are we going to tolerate poverty in the future? If poverty can be managed by, you know, some simple act, let's dream about the future. And so um, we're going to have uh, Gawawa uh, sing in language when the war is over. Thank you uh, for letting us be part of this today. Um, we, we, we said very uh, clearly at the start, never give blackfellas microphones. Uh, you'll be sorry. Um, thank you for being so brave. And thank you for the 80 plus people who stayed with us the entire time. Uh, take care, enjoy the rest of the conference. So here we go.
So let's all move to a better place when this war is over. Thanks, everyone.